to open up with a song, and we don't got Sandy on the piano, and we don't got Kurt up here leading, so we're going to, we're going to, Caleb's going to pipe it through for us again here, but number eight, holy, 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 <laughs> it probably wasn't proper English, and I got to be careful, I don't know if all of you know this, but I'm going to, I'm going to reveal some secrets this morning about, uh, Matt Ewers. We do have a doctor in the room. Oh no! no. So he's gonna he's gonna be he's gonna be checking us out, isn't he? No. Well, see, we always had Shannon. She's a master. She's got her master's degree. So now we got uh, Matt. He's got his. He's got his doctorate. So I think I, I don't think he only has one doc. Now this is a rumor, so he'll have to tell if it's true. But I've heard that he's got several doctorate degrees. Is that true, Matt? You shouldn't believe everything. <laughs> okay. Don't believe everything. All right. Well then right. Let's sing holy, holy, holy. As Caleb brings it through there, let's listen to it one time through. We'll pick it up after it plays through once and sing just the first two verses. Pay special attention to verse uh, number two, where I'll just read it to it. It says, Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea, cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which work and art and evermore shall be. And we had... There's Jackie. Jackie made it. Um, we're going to be looking at we're looking at the doctrine of angels. Last week we looked at the cherubims. This week we're going to look at the seraphim. So I thought the song went right hand in hand with uh, some of the things that we're going to be looking at from God's word. So number eight, holy, holy, holy. Caleb, we're going to he'll play us through once, then we'll come in. All right, I'm going to open us up with a word of prayer and then we're going to get going because we don't got much time, right? We don't have much time. <laughs> All right. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, just for this morning. Uh, Father, that you've brought us here to come and look at your word, Lord, to grow thereby. Father, we just ask that you be in each one of our hearts and that you would lead and that you would guide us by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And Lord, also that you'd direct our mind and that you'd direct our heart to the Lord Jesus Christ because we know that it's through him that we're able to come here and worship and adore your name this morning. Just be in this time and the time that follows in our regular church service 
We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm going to just hit just a little bit of <clears throat> review again, just to get us up to speed uh, where, we, where we are. We are we've covered... Um, the moral classification of angels, that's not on the sheet that you have right there, but it's on a prior sheet. And we learned in that three terms that I want to bring before us again and see if we can't remember what they are. When God created the angels in the beginning, he created them posse non pacari. And I think Matt, probably being a Bible student, might be able to tell us what that means. Do you know, brother? Something to do without sin or Okay. <laughs> yeah. And he is, if you don't know a lot about Matt, Matt is an Old Testament uh, Hebrew scholar, I would call him. He, he knows the Old Testament. He knows Hebrew. I think he can speak Hebrew. So, we <laughs> Maybe. Maybe, maybe not. But here, posse non picari means able not to sin. Remember? When God created the angels, he created them with the ability not to sin. And Lucifer chose to sin. And when he did, then we have a different classification. Does anybody remember what that's called? Yep, Kyler got it. Non posse, non picari, which means not able not to sin. So we have one classification of the angels, which are the devil and his angels, which is that group that are always going to sin and always about sin. And then we have a third group, which are the holy and the elect angels. And those holy and elect angels are non posse pacari. What does that mean? Who remembers that? Jackie, you're smiling. Do you remember? Not able to sin. Exactly right. And then after that, we covered that. We began to look at the classification of the characteristics of these faithful angels. We began to look at their ranks. And the first group that we looked at were the archangels. Who remembers? Who the two archangels are? Carol said Gabriel and Michael. And that's exactly right. And then uh, last week we covered uh, the second group or classification of angels, which were the cherubim. And today we are going to look at the seraphim. The seraphim. And the seraphim are only mentioned... And one place in the Bible that I found, maybe you can find a different place, but I believe there's only one spot, which is Isaiah chapter number 6. So if you open to Isaiah chapter 6, the word seraphim, Hebrew word means burning ones. I think it probably speaks of their burning devotion to God. Their burning devotion to God. And they are, like I said before, only mentioned once in the Bible here in Isaiah chapter 6. So I want to read that to us if you're there. Starting in verse 1. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of Him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. 
and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon, his mouth, upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, or who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Send me. Well, I think the first thing that I want to bring to our mind in this passage is what Isaiah sees. He says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now, I haven't seen that in my mind. We've been talking about on Wednesday nights, though, that Matthew 18, 20 says that when we gather, there's two or three of us gathered together, the Lord is in the center of us. He's here. And how He is, we've been looking at what He would look like if God opened our minds to be able to see Him. We see Him by faith. But if we actually could see Him, we would see what John saw in Revelation chapter number 1 when he sees the great high priest, the judge of all the earth. But here we see He sees... The Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And what does the high and lifted up mean to us? But it speaks that he was high and lifted up. Do you think he was standing or do you think he was seated? What do you think? It doesn't say here though, does it? He would have been seated. High and lifted up and he would have been seated upon the throne showing that he is the one of all dignity. He is the one of true majesty. There isn't anyone that's higher or greater than Him. He is high and lifted up and seated upon the throne. And that's what Isaiah saw. And then the, His train fills the temple. His train fills the temple. And I think it gives us an illustration. If we look back to the Old Testament temple, which Isaiah was familiar with, what filled the Holy of Holies? When they're singing, Holy, 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 what filled it? What filled the Holy of Holies? Anybody? The Shekinah. The Shekinah glory of the Lord. We remember the Shekinah, right? The cloud, the pillar cloud that led them by day, the fire that led them by night. When it would go up, then Israel would go. When it would stop, then they would stop. But it would go upon the temple. It would go in the Holy of Holies. So I think when we're looking at it, it says, He's high and lifted up and His train filled the temple. It was full of the Lord's glory. Full of glory. Full of His glory. And I just, I just can't quite imagine it in my mind right now. But I know there comes a day, and I think the day is coming sooner, where I'm going to be and you're going to be in the presence of the Lord, and we're going to see the fullness of the Lord's glory. Just like Isaiah saw. And I think with some of the things that we see going on currently, well, law that passed from our federal government and stuff just as a late with the uh, acceptation of the uh, same-sex marriages. The day is approaching and it's coming quickly. I, mean, I know Brother Kurt prayed about that on Wednesday when we gathered. I could see it in his heart. But Brother Kurt said this. He said, Lord, oh Lord, oh, just show your mercy and be long-suffering because there's little ones. There's those that haven't come to salvation in the Lord that need to see you. And oh, his heart was for the little ones. His heart was for the little ones. And then we see 
in verse number 2. Above it stood the seraphims. Above the great throne. Here are the seraphim. And what are the seraphim doing? We see they're saying, Holy, holy, holy. They're worshiping, aren't they? And I want this to get our heart ready. Our heart ready for the time when we're going to worship here in just a little bit. Because the, the seraphim are doing just that with the one that's lifted up high. They're worshiping and they're adoring Him and that's exactly what He wants us to do is to worship Him. But notice, they have six wings. The cherubim. How many wings did the cherubim have? Cherubim didn't have six. They had four. Now we see the seraphim, a different class that actually has six. And I want you to take note of what they do with their wings. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. For each of these wings, two of them are doing a different thing. The first two, what are they doing? The first twain, as it says, the two, what are they doing? What are they doing, Carol? They are covering their face. The second ones, what are they doing? Covering their feet. What are the third set of wings doing? Flying. So what's the significance to us, to the covering of the face, to the covering of the feet, to the flying. I think it speaks some things to us to take in. And first of all, I want you to try and imagine the picture. It's hard to see them. We saw a good picture in what the cherubim looked like. We don't have quite as good of a look of the seraphim, but we see a little bit. And I want you to see this in your mind. The first set of wings are covering the face. Why? Why? Oh, just think of the glory. Think of the glory of the Almighty God on the throne, seated, and the seraphim in the presence. And I think it's, it's that, what do you do when you're in awe of one? Oh, don't you? Oh, I'm in awe of the one that sits upon the throne. Are you, are you in awe of our great and mighty God this morning? like the seraphim, and covering their face. Not only their face, but it says they covered their feet. Well, if they had the wings and they covered their feet, really it's representation of they're covering their body. They're covering their body with the second set of wings that it talks about. Why would they cover their body in the presence of the Lord? I think it speaks that as we look at ourself, even as the seraphim looked at who they were and who the Almighty was, that they were nothing compared to Him. They were nothing. I'm nothing compared to the Almighty. Even though I'm a seraphim, I'm nothing compared because I'm a creative being of God. And our, is that our heart? Is that our heart this morning? That I am nothing, oh God, in comparison to you, and that's what the wings, the second set, speak of. And then we see those. The sixth, the, the third set of the wings. To fly. That means, I think, I believe, that they're ready to execute and be obedient to the one that sits upon the throne. He speaks anything to them, they're going to go and do exactly what He has said because we remember that these are the holy and the elect angels. That means they're not able to sin. They're going to do exactly what He that sits on the throne tells them to do without hesitation. So we, in our life, are we ready? Are we ready when the Lord tells us to do something? to do it now and be obedient to Him? Are we willing to go forth in obedience to Him? 
And I want you to notice as we move on what the seraphim are doing then in the next verse, verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Actually, Matt and I met just this week together. And Matt mentioned this exact phrase. Do you remember, Matt? No. You do too. <laughs> you do too. It means something specific when you repeat holy, holy, holy. Just like in the New Testament when we say verily, verily, or we say truly, truly. It means something. But I'm not going to look at the significance of necessarily holy, holy, holy. But what I want you to catch is this. One cried unto another and said, one cried to another and said, it was almost when we sing, sometimes we sing in an echo, we sing where one person sings and then somebody else comes in and sings and then another one comes in. And, you know what I'm talking about. So one of these angels, one of these seraphim would say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And another one would echo, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And it would go on and it would go on. And then they would all come together in unison. And you know what they would say in unison would be this. The whole earth is full of his glory. Can you imagine hearing that in the heavens as they're declaring the holiness of God? See, how do we know that? How do we know that they possibly echoed this? Well, if we go back, and I think Matt probably knows some of this, but you go back and you look at things and customs of the Hebrews when they were singing and they would sing songs and things were coming forward. That's exactly what is going on. And that's what is intended behind it for us. So, I'm thinking of their worship. When we come, and Brother Kurt comes right up here, and he's going to lead us in our music this morning, we need to have a heart. We need to have a heart of worship, just like the seraphim did. And I want you to notice one thing when they're singing this. Verse 4, And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. That's not speaking of the Lord. That's speaking of the angels. The seraphim, as they sing, the posts of the door moved. They shook. That speaks a little bit of the power and the might and their desire to worship. You remember Brother Kurt saying, he used to say this when we were at Grace Baptist. We need to sing. And we need to lift the rafters on the church. We need to raise them up, right? And I think I've heard him say in here, the ceiling tiles. We've got the ceiling tiles in here. Let's move these ceiling tiles up. The Lord wants us to worship. And he wants us to adore his name when we come to our worship time. And he goes on. Oh, I want to hit one other point here. The last part where, where the angels were singing and it says the whole earth is full of His glory. When I hear that phrase, I'm reminded of John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Because the Lord of glory came in the flesh of the man, didn't he? Full of glory, full of light, to shed light upon the earth. And then we see what Isaiah says. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He sees and he recognizes his sin. And he sees and he recognizes the sin of Israel. Because it said this was in the time when King Uz Uzziah had died, right? 
He had died. It was actually the kingdom, right? The kingdom stage of the Bible where there was kings that were ruling. Jeroboam, actually at this time, was ruling the northern kingdom. Uzziah happened to be the king that came on after his father. I believe his father was Amaziah, which was a good king, which was doing what God wanted him to do. But Israel as a nation had fallen into idolatry, worshiping false gods. So he sees his sin, but he also sees the sin of Israel, the sin of idolatry that's come upon them. And he's taken back by that sin. But then there's one of these seraphim. There's one of the seraphim. It says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So we say, he takes a coal from the altar, He takes a coal from the altar and he brings it over and touches Isaiah's lips with the coal. Well, the coal came from which altar? Who knows what altar it came from? Anybody? What altar did the seraphim take it from? Oh, Isaiah knew the temple that Solomon had, had built. He knew about the tabernacle that Moses had built. So what he sees is he sees the seraphim goes and takes the coal from the altar of burnt offering. Or we looked at it on Wednesday, the brazen altar. He takes it from the brazen altar and he touches his lips. What we looked at on Wednesday, I want to read from Revelation 1 again, just a little point there. When we were looking at Jesus standing in the midst of us. Revelation 1 and verse 15 is what we looked at on Wednesday and it said, And his feet, like unto fine brass, as if they had burned in a furnace. His feet, like unto fine brass. Well, we looked at on Wednesday that